Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, my name is Tony Golan, and I am the acting chair for the Department of OBGYN here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And uh, we have for the last eight months or so, um, every week, uh, sponsored a hotline for our patients. And we hope that that's been helpful to folks um, as we've navigated through really changing times. Um, and we realize that uh, now we're facing some new information, new challenges, and new questions. Um, might be helpful for just to for us to just kind of go over some rules of the road. Um, we are here with you to provide information, um, but there's no substitute for talking with your own physician or your own provider. So this isn't in any way meant to be medical advice for you, but rather general guidance information. And then often we talk here about different processes and policies that exist within Beth Israel Deaconess. And I think today we actually have people joining us who might be even planning to deliver their baby somewhere else, which is totally fine, but some of the information may not actually apply um, to you. Today, um, we are joined by two experts who um, together are going to answer your questions today. I imagine that many questions will be about vaccines, but um, some of the questions that I received ahead of time also talk about um, things that are general considerations during COVID and thinking about pregnancy, um, breastfeeding during this time. So I think we'll have time to get to everything. Um, it's a good idea to use that Q&A box um, that you have at the bottom of your screen. You can type in the questions um, and we will answer them as they come in. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Collier and Dr. Zash with us today. Um, Dr. Rebecca Zash is, is an infectious disease specialist and she has a special interest in how infections affect pregnancy and breastfeeding. She's a member of the faculty here at BIDMC and also at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Iris Collier is a member of the OBGYN department and is a specialist in high-risk pregnancy. And she has particular interest in the immune system during pregnancy. And she works in one of the foremost vaccine development labs that's based here at BIDMC. So thank you, um, Dr. Zash and Dr. Collier. Um, and I think we'll just go ahead and get started with, um, with some of the questions that came in beforehand. But if questions come up as we're talking, um, do go ahead and, and type them into that Q&A box. I should also mention that I am recording this um, and we are um, going to be posting this in a way that will be accessible to you all, um, hopefully sometime within the next couple of days. Um, so I, I hope that's useful because I know that this is um, not necessarily the best time of day for everybody. Um, so uh, the first question um, is, uh, if someone gets the vaccine, um, is there a possible, is it possible that they could still carry the virus? So I think this question specifically relates to not as a result of the vaccine itself, but rather if you get the vaccine, what does that prevent? Does it prevent asymptomatic, being an asymptomatic carrier or does it just prevent the disease itself? Maybe Dr. Zash could start us off with that. Sure. Um, so that's a great question. And I think, you know, just to be clear, the vaccine itself definitely can't make you have COVID. It's not a live vaccine. There's no way. Um, but the way that the vaccines so far have been tested, um, they've really been looking for symptomatic COVID infections. So we don't totally know yet whether they prevent all uh, COVID infections or just symptomatic ones. Um, and I think that data will be coming with time as more and more people uh, get the virus. So we're not totally clear that we couldn't have an asymptomatic where you could pass it along to somebody else. Yeah, I guess I would echo that response as well that the, the vaccines that are currently available are not live viruses. So you cannot get um, COVID-19 from getting the vaccination. And at least the studies that have been done so far show that they're quite good at um, preventing symptomatic infections. Um, so that doesn't mean, like Dr. Zash said, that you couldn't potentially get a symptomatic infection or potentially get an asymptomatic infection during pregnancy, even after vaccination. But the preliminary um, studies are very optimistic about preventing some of those severe complications of COVID-19. 
I guess that also underscores another important thing, which is um, until um, enough of the population is vaccinated, even once you're vaccinated, it's still important to um, continue to use all those infection control public health measures, including masking and distancing and avoiding gatherings, um, because it is theoretically possible um, that you could carry the virus potentially, but not from the vaccine itself. Um, the next question, I think Dr. Collier probably um, is in your wheelhouse. Um, so I'm currently nursing my five month old. If I happen to get the vaccine while nursing, or I guess if I choose to get the vaccine while nursing, is there a possibility it will protect the baby? Likewise, if I pumped and gave it to my two-year-old, two-year-old, might it protect uh, your two-year-old as well? It's a great question. Yes, I like that question. Um, personally, I've thought about that myself too. Um, there is definitely um, emerging data, at least from the patients who are infected naturally with the SARS-CoV-2 infection that antibodies that are neutralizing or protect against viral um, infection are present in breast milk. Um, so that is kind of actually an argument for why uh, lactating patients should get the vaccine because um, it has other protections, not just a, against the lactating mother, but could potentially um, be protective for infections of the neonates, which we know, you know, have kind of immature immune systems and also are not in the inclusion for who's going to be able to get a COVID-19 vaccine in the near future. I guess in terms of being a vaccine recipient, um, children have not really been extent, have not been studied. Um, we're not part of the trials, um, but we certainly do know from other vaccines that we use during pregnancy, including um, the vaccine that we provide for to prevent whooping cough, that certainly that helps to protect the fetus as well. Um, the next question is, um, another great question. Uh, this is probably for Dr. Collier too, I, I think. Um, what are my risks if I get a fever as a side effect from the vaccine? This particular person happens to be 22 weeks, but I suppose you could answer the question dependent on gestational age maybe. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, that is some concern that you know after the vaccine and right now the vaccine available, it comes in two doses that the, you, you're, you can get a fever as a side effect of the vaccine. In general, we're recommending that pregnant patients can take Tylenol if they get a fever. And, and most of those fevers are short lived. They, they don't last longer than two days. Um, we do, you know, and even when the, you know, OBGYN, um, college, college of OBGYN and every, everyone has reviewed the information, recommend that, especially in the first trimester, um, fever can be dangerous to develop development of organs. So we do recommend taking the Tylenol and that Tylenol is safe in pregnancy. At 22 weeks, we don't necessarily, you know, the organs are formed. So it's specific to that question, um, not as worried about the fever actually causing any harm, um, though we do recommend it's safe to take Tylenol to treat those symptoms. Great. Um, I think uh, there's a general question next, and I think maybe this gives us an opportunity to just sort of step back a little um, around sort of the safety profile and what we think about safety um, for the vaccine during breastfeeding um, and postpartum is this specific question. But maybe Dr. Zash, you could just talk about sort of where we stand with how we feel about safety for the vaccine. Sure. You know, um, I think it's kind of said best that, that the vaccine is safe if the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. Um, and I think we, we're, we're starting to understand the benefits. We certainly know the, what happens if people get COVID, which is you know young and healthy people generally do okay, but definitely still get severe disease. And uh, women who are pregnant seem to get severe disease more than their non-pregnant same aged uh, cohort. So we think that the risks are increased in pregnancy so that getting uh, a vaccine in pregnancy may actually have an even uh, you know, bigger benefit to pregnant women in preventing the severe disease. Um, none of the studies, I, I think probably most people know, none of these vaccine studies so far have included uh, pregnant or lactating women on, on purpose, they've excluded them. So we don't have really specific data around that. 
Um, but, but, you know, speaking with lots of my um, both OB and ID colleagues, you know, I think that there's not any specific concern about a risk. Um, you know, there may be some theoretical things that we don't know very well, but so far it seems like if people are at risk of getting COVID um, and pregnant and, you know, with at higher risk of getting severe disease, the benefits, you know, are most likely to outweigh any potential risks. And I think for breastfeeding, that's even more so um, where there's really no risks we can think of at all from this vaccination in, in breastfeeding. And like Dr. Uh, Collier said before, there's actually a lot of reasons to think it might be helpful. Um, so I, I think, you know, everybody or the, the society guidelines um, and the CDC has really said there's no reason that lactating women shouldn't get this vaccine. Um, and I think in pregnancy, it's just more that we don't have the data yet. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have data for this kind of vaccine previously in pregnant women either, um, which is why some people are hesitant. Um, the one good thing that I know is coming is that uh, Moderna is going to start a vaccine trial specifically in pregnancy uh, very soon. So I think that there will be some data coming out uh, in the next few months to a year. Terrific. Um, you know, apropos of your description of sort of thinking about making the decision to have the vaccine during pregnancy and weighing risk versus benefits, I think it's kind of a common way of thinking that we think in the medical world of sort of um, almost every decision is a weighing of risk versus benefits, but it may not be as commonly sort of known or understood what the risks of COVID during pregnancy are, in fact, um, because each of us as individuals really sees a very small sliver um, of the population on a day-to-day -day basis. So Dr. Collier, the next question is, um, what, have, what has been seen um, in terms of symptoms and time of recovery, or I guess I would add disease course um, for pregnant women who have been diagnosed with COVID? Yes, that's, that's a great question. And I think um, a lot of the data has come out this past fall and winter, um, now that we've accumulated enough cases just within the United States of pregnant infected individuals. And, um, speaks to the fact that pregnancy is kind of a vulnerable and, and vulnerable and more likely to become severe COVID-19 infections. And that's why um, it is our, we're kind of advocating for, um, you know, getting, thinking about, you know, the uncertainties of the vaccine, but also the potential um, large benefits of avoiding getting a severe infection from COVID-19. The data from the United States are uh, pretty clear that uh, compared to women who are not pregnant in the same age group, that uh, pregnancy confers a higher likelihood of needing to go to the critical care unit, the ICU, and higher need for um, using a mechanical ventilator or needed respiratory support. And even some of the newer data actually demonstrates that some pregnant may patients may be more likely to die of COVID-19 than their age-matched women. Um, so that's kind of what we contextualize things. I know, you know, taking a medication in pregnancy can be frightening or a vaccination, um, but when a vaccine has such potential benefit of preventing COVID-19, um, we do kind of take that into consideration, particularly for those patients who are pregnant and have other medical conditions that may make them more likely to have a very severe infection. Great. Um, the next question, uh, I think probably is also for you, Dr. Collier, um, do elicited antibodies cross the placenta? That's a great question and something I'm um, studying right now too. Um, this has been shown in other vaccinated um, viruses like influenza um, that the antibodies, you know, when mother is vaccinated or with the pertussis vaccine, when the pregnant patient isn't vaccinated, those antibodies generated by the mom are actually passed into the um, neo fetus and neonates uh, circulation. And that's why we actually recommend vaccines during pregnancy like the Tdap vaccine, because we know that the placenta can pass those protective antibodies and can be beneficial to the neonate. So similarly, we do see that um, antibodies specific to SARS-CoV-2 are transferred through the placenta from mom to the infant. Um, 
I think we don't have the information about vaccine elicited antibodies, but there's no reason to think that those wouldn't also be transported through the placenta and be protective. Great. I guess in general, we know that there are certain types of antibodies, certain classifications of antibodies that generally do cross the placenta and others that don't. And uh, with this particular vaccine, we would think that it's the type of antibodies that do cross um, and, there's, and that there would potentially be some benefit from that. Um, the next question is, is there a concern that a pregnant woman would not mount a response to the vaccine due to our immunocompromised state? Um, there's, there's a lot there. Um, I think there's probably uh, opportunity for Dr. Zash to talk about the immune response. And then maybe Dr. Collier, you could talk about, um, I think this perhaps confusing concept of whether or not pregnant people are in fact immunocompromised. Sure. I mean, I think that um, the kind of simple answer is we know from lots of other vaccines that, that pregnant people um, are able to mount a very effective response um, and be protected from viruses. Um, and we don't think that this should be any different. Um, again, we don't know exactly yet because we haven't studied it, but, but I don't think there's any reason to think that this should be any different. And um, I think Dr. Kellier could tell you why. <laughs> Yeah, I think this is an area I'm, I'm highly interested in. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think pregnancy does affect the immune system. And some, you know, sometimes that's a for a good reason. Uh, when you're carrying a pregnancy that has, you know, genetic information from, you know, that's technically foreign from the paternal side, um, that could be a risk for, you know, rejection of that pregnancy. So the immune system is a little bit muted for that reason. Um, but again, and, and, you, and you may see that clinically because you know, during pregnancy, some women are more susceptible to infections, either respiratory or otherwise. Um, but I would echo what Dr. Zash says is that it doesn't completely make you immune compromised. So vaccines um, for other um, infections have been shown to be effective even when given in pregnancy. So it's not such a huge immunocompromise that we anticipate that this wouldn't also show benefit in pregnancy. Um, thanks. Um, the next question I might uh, I might uh, answer myself because I think it's uh, it's not uh, specifically in your uh, in your um, areas of interest, and this relates to: Are there any guidelines? for infertility patients that are actively trying to get pregnant. Um, so the guidelines for infertility patients or, or any patients actually that are actively trying to get pregnant is that um, they should be considered um, for vaccination the same as anyone else um, and that they're not in a different sort of category of risk um, compared to other people. So depending on whether they have medical co comorbidities or perhaps if they were a healthcare worker themselves, um, they are being and should be offered um, the vaccine in the same way as other folks. Um, the next question is, should you still get the vaccine if you've previously tested positive for COVID? Um, I think Dr. Zash. Yeah, the current recommendations have come out um, that even if you've had COVID in the past, you should still get the vaccine. Um, and, you know, part of that is we don't know when you naturally get COVID, how long your antibodies last, how long your immune response would still fight off the virus. Um, and there's no reason not to. Um, there are some guidelines about how long afterwards and, and that kind of testing. But in generally speaking, even if you've had COVID in the past, you should definitely get the vaccine. I think originally, or uh, at, at the very first, there was some discussion of possibly excluding patients um, who had had it, uh, perhaps it was within the last few months or so, but then the final recommendation was, was pretty clear um, about um, that those people who have had, who have had COVID should um, get the vaccine in the same way as others are being offered the vaccine. Yes, um, and on that similar note, they don't recommend testing for your antibodies if you've had a prior infection before getting the vaccine. So regardless, and they don't recommend testing for pregnancy necessarily um, before you get the vaccine. 
Good point. Good point. Or if you become pregnant between the first dose and second dose, they don't recommend stopping um, the vaccine course. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a really important point, I think, too, because some people will find themselves in that position. Um, and I guess that also reflects uh, sort of a growing area of knowledge around how um, natural immunity works versus how vaccine-induced um, immunity might work and, and sort of the differences between that. But um, we do feel that the benefits of the vaccine in, the, in that circumstance um, are significant. Um, the next question is about timing. So um, asking for recommendations on how to time vaccination for pregnant people. Um, if a person is already in the third trimester, is there a recommendation for timing the second dose to be postpartum? Um, I think Dr. Collier, probably this is a good question for you. Yeah, currently we don't have any um, strict data to re have recommendations about when during pregnancy or postpartum to receive the vaccine. Um, so if there's a pregnant person who is in one of these categories for receiving the vaccine, then um, there aren't any guidelines about which time. So if it happens to be that you're late third trimester, you get your first dose and your postpartum uh, for the second dose, we would just keep on that same vaccine schedule. And, and I would just add that um, I would never delay that second one because although we actually think now the first done probably gives you a good amount of immunity. The, the second one really gets you up to near sort of 95%. So the sooner you have both, the better. So, so I just wouldn't delay. The next question is, do we have any idea when vaccine trials might start with women who are pregnant? Um, and I think we touched on this a little bit, but maybe it might be interesting to talk about that a bit more. Um, and any thoughts on getting vaccinated before getting pregnant versus waiting to get vaccinated once already pregnant or waiting until after delivering? Um, maybe I'll answer the very last part and then maybe Dr. Zash, you could talk a little bit more about what, what we know um, around including pregnant people um, in some of the trials that are ongoing. Um, so in general, our recommendation is that um, people consider vaccination when they otherwise become eligible to be vaccinated, regardless of whether they are considering becoming pregnant or pregnant in early pregnancy, later pregnancy, postpartum or breastfeeding. Um, we believe that at all of those stages, it's, it's highly likely that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risks and the risks of getting the disease are greater than the risk of vaccination. So, um, so we, um, I think as Dr. Zash referred to just a minute ago as well, in response to a different question, um, we really encourage people to have that conversation with their healthcare provider and when they decide to get the vaccine to follow along the prescribed schedule um, for the vaccine. Yeah, and then in terms of when we might get uh, data on vaccinations in pregnant people, um, I'd first say that there was a lot of advocacy trying to get pregnant people involved in these very first trials. Uh, it didn't happen, unfortunately. Um, so we don't have it yet, but people really wanted that from the advocacy world. Um, but because that didn't happen, um, but there are many, many pregnant people who are going to be eligible for the vaccine. I know um, that personally that Moderna is planning and um, that the FDA is putting a lot of pressure on them to move up their plans to test in pregnant people. Um, I don't know the plans for Pfizer or for other vaccines now, but I suspect that, um, you know, FDA really knows that this is a, a big deal and, a, and an important thing. So I hope in the sort of first half of, of the next year, uh, we'll get some bigger trials. Right. And I, I think the one thing that we do know is in the you know, FDA report from the Pfizer vaccine is that they will follow the 12 or so pregnancies that were in the vaccinated arm for outcomes and the, I forget, like 11 in the placebo arm too for outcomes. Um, now, obviously that's not enough numbers to have definitive information. And, and those were all patients who were very early in their pregnancies surrounding the vaccine and some got only one dose. Um, but yeah, I, I do think, you know, going on to the future, because the pregnant patients are at higher risk of COVID-19, they will need to be included in, in future trials. 
And one thing I think that may not be entirely obvious is that the trials, even though there's been an emergency use authorization for the use of these vaccines, the trials are ongoing. Um, so we're going to continue to learn more, um, even about the population that is already enrolled in the trials. Um, so uh, the amount of information that's going to be available to everyone um, is really going to be um, enormous um, over the next probably six to 12 months. Um, there's a, a follow-up question um, regarding uh, timing of vaccination. Um, and it looks like, I think this relates to the question that we had answered before. Um, I guess I'll just say, a um, say it again, because I know that um, there's a lot of information uh, just to sort of repeat it again, that uh, if you're in a group um, that is being offered vaccination, um, we would encourage you to have that conversation with your healthcare provider about being vaccinated, regardless of whether you're considering pregnancy, you're early in pregnancy, in the middle, or in the late third trimester, postpartum, breastfeeding. Um, we really feel uh, that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks um, and the risks of the disease of COVID um, outweigh what the risks of the vaccine might be. Um, that's always an individual conversation, but um, there does not seem to be any difference uh, between that timing of preconception during pregnancy and postpartum. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, for example, who happens to be in your first trimester, you might have been offered the vaccine this week. Um, and we would certainly encourage you to consider um, taking the vaccine at this point um, uh, as if you were uh, a part of any other uh, group. Um, the next question is, how long will the antibodies remain in breast milk after receiving the vaccine? I think, Dr. Collier, that's you. Yeah, I, I think there aren't that many large, large studies reporting that and the duration. And, and you have to remember also that we're not, it seems like it's been a long time. We're not that far into the pandemic to have that accumulated a whole lot of data. And it, I think just like the antibodies in your blood system, it varies depending on how the context of which you got them. So some patients with very severe infections may have launch a higher antibody response. Um, so I think the long answer is we don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and then another follow-up question about avoiding the vaccine um, if you're trying to become pregnant and whether there are theoretical risks that might be worse in the first trimester. Um, I think I'll, I'll answer this one, but uh, Dr. Zash and Dr. Collier, please chime in if, I've, uh, if I don't have it right or if there's other things to add. So um, we don't advise changing your life plan um, based on vaccination. So um, if you're in a group that's being offered vaccination, um, we would uh, encourage you to have that conversation with your healthcare provider and consider vaccination. Um, the theoretical risks, um, uh, Dr. Collier talked a little bit earlier about fever and um, the fact that we do try to avoid uh, people having sustained high fevers during the first trimester and for that reason recommend Tylenol. Um, that, recommendation, that recommendation wouldn't be any different um, whether you had received the vaccine or not. Um, would, would, that, would you agree, Dr. Collier? I agree, yes. And, uh, and like we say, we recommend getting the flu vaccine, for instance, also, um, and that's a recommendation for all pregnant patients, regardless of the trimester that they're in right now. And, and so sometimes there can be a, a fever associated with that vaccine as well, and we recommend the same. And, and I would just add, because I've heard this kind of a lot as it relates to vaccines, the word mRNA can kind of make people think it gets into your genetics and maybe causes you know, changes in the baby's genetics, but this doesn't change your DNA, doesn't get into your DNA, doesn't change genetics, doesn't even get into the nucleus of the cell. So um, I think that's a, a concern I've heard a lot of people have, but it, with this kind of uh, vaccine, that's, that's really not a concern. I saw an analogy online that uh, I liked. Um, it was a little bit amusing about what the vaccine does is it sends an email to your cell and then the cell looks at the email that's outside the window 
and then it disappears like a Snapchat does. Um, but the cell gets the message and it does what it needs to do. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't change anything about um, about your own genetics, your own chromosomes, or your or your babies or fetuses um, genes, chromosomes, or um, or other parts of of DNA. Um, the next question is, uh, is it true that there were about 500 women that became pregnant during the Moderna trial? If so, did they see any adverse outcomes with these women? Um, I don't think there were 500. There were some, a few. I think about 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think in both Pfizer and Moderna, there were about a dozen-ish or so. Yeah. About that? And okay. say for the Moderna one specifically, there were maybe, um, 11 to 12, and then only six of them were in the vaccine um, arm. Yeah, and just, just to sort of say it out loud, um, it's really impossible um, to draw any kind of meaningful conclusion from that small number of people. Um, so although there were observations um, of what the, happened uh, for those people, they really don't have any significance in terms of us being able to provide advice or draw conclusions from it. Um, there's a specific question here, which I think is slightly different from what we've talked about before, maybe gets at, at something very specific, which is what are the theoretical risks to the fetus of the vaccine? Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about um, that might be a theoretical risk? I I can't think of anything, but. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I've had a lot of colleagues ask that as well about the mRNA. Um, like Dr. Zash said, it's a very short-lived molecule. In fact, usually it just gets in the lab. We have to handle this very carefully and that's why the ultra low temperatures so it doesn't just degrade on its own. So we're not thinking, you know, even in, um, the mom circulation, it doesn't stay for, it only stays for a couple of days. We're not anticipating this um, vaccine product will be in your system for a prolonged period of time. You know, there, it, it, and it mostly gets degraded pretty rapidly after the code is, is used. Um, there is that possibility that people think about, about this mRNA vaccine getting to the placenta or the fetus um, that, you know, obviously wasn't tested in these trials um, and we don't know information about, but there's not, uh, you know, reason to think that it would accumulate in the placenta or on the fetal side. And even if some small portion of the vaccine got across, again, the same thing would be that it's very short lived. Um, so it wouldn't be present for very long. And then on the breast milk, uh, I think, for lactating individuals, it's the same, you know, the molecule, it's, it's possible theoretically that it gets into breast milk. But again, once the infant receives breast milk, it actually goes through the infant's GI tract and then would have to be get um, some small, even smaller fraction would get into the bloodstream. So we really don't worry about the theoretic risks of getting the vaccine molecule into the breast milk. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I completely agree. I've also asked as many people as I could think of uh, about theoretical risks and, and haven't heard anything and think, you know, um, what we're much more likely to find in actual trials with pregnant women are, you know, theoretical benefits that, that we, that it's going to help both maternal and fetal health. Um, and I, I just think that sort of, um, Sometimes people are always worried because we don't have data about the theoretical risk, but I, I think it's also important to kind of think about those theoretical benefits of not getting COVID. Yeah. Um, the next question um, is, are there current vaccinations that are not advised to get in pregnancy? Um, I know that, that influenza vaccine is advised in Tdap, but are there vaccines that are considered dangerous in pregnancy? Um, it's a really important question. Uh, maybe Dr. Zash, you could answer that. Sure. Yeah, we tend to avoid um, giving live virus vaccines, which is where the vaccine is made by actually taking the whole virus, but making it not work. Um, so we don't give those types of, vir uh, of uh, vaccines in pregnancy. And this is uh, none of the vaccines that are being tested for COVID is that type of vaccination. 
Um, working as a frontline healthcare worker, I am allowed to take the current vaccine through Pfizer. Um, however, as you mentioned, Moderna is coming out with a vaccine that is going to be looking at pregnant women. Um, would it be worth waiting to get the vaccine at a later date with this new information? Dr. Zash? Yeah, I mean, again, I think a lot of these decisions are, are individual um, in terms of like, what is my risk of getting COVID now? Because I, I think we think that the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine are going to be uh, pretty equally as effective. And I wouldn't sort of choose one over the other um, based on that. And I also suspect if Moderna is going to do um, a trial in pregnancy, so will Pfizer. I, I just don't know as much about the what's going on with Pfizer. Um, so, you know, again, it, it, what's the risk of waiting for a person? You know, how likely is it you might get exposed to COVID now but while waiting? I think that should be the basis of the decision. Yeah, I agree. I think even for, depending on whether you're a, a nurse in the ICU or frontline worker, you you need to just take into account your own individual risk based on your exposures at work, at home, in the community, and the you know community prevalence of SARS-CoV-2. And so I agree with Dr. Zash. I, I don't think there's going to be at this point, enough information to for us to advise you during pregnancy to get one vaccine type versus the other. The next question is, um, given that no DART, I'm not sure if that's referring to cytobine or um, that's referring to something else, studies have been performed. How does ACOG justify their stance or guidelines made public for patients and providers? Um, I think this, probably is best answered by something that we've um, talked about uh, during this time, which is, uh, you know, as with other medical decision making, we really weigh risks versus benefits. And um, by every account from looking at the data related to this vaccine, the characteristics of this vaccine, as well as really importantly, our historical knowledge based on other vaccines that we provide during pregnancy, um, we feel pretty strongly that the right thing to do is to offer vaccine and make it available to pregnant people, to postpartum people. Um, this is an individual decision, but we do believe that the benefits of the vaccine um, greatly outweigh the risks. Um, and again, as Dr. Collier said, um, some of that um, is your own sort of thought around what your risk exposure is. So if you're a healthcare worker, um, your risk exposure might be greater than if you um, were able to always be at home and only have contact with the people that you live with. Um, the next question, is, the, sorry, the next question is, um, what are the current thoughts in the vaccine prior to pregnancy? Um, we talked about the fact that um, we would view uh, your decision to take the vaccine prior to pregnancy in the same way as if you were not considering pregnancy, you would be viewed um, in the same groups um, as are currently kind of uh, grouped together or stratified. Um, and is there any projected effect on fertility or the safety of an upcoming planned pregnancy? Uh, we don't have data on that specifically, but there's no reason to believe that it would affect a future pregnancy. Um, next question is, I go ahead. To add on to that, um, you know, the vaccine utilizes a protein that's produced by the SARS-CoV-2 or a component, just one out of like 20, Five or 26 proteins there. And so our experience with in patients who have been infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 doesn't tell us that there's any issues with infertility. So we're not suspecting that um, receiving a vaccine with just one of those proteins um, would necessarily affect fertility as well. Great. Um, this is a question around complications of the postpartum period. Um, so certainly, you know, complications, obstetrical complications are, are something that happens um, and so, certainly something that we do our best to prevent and detect early. Is there any evidence or suspicion or reason to believe that receiving the COVID vaccine could have any exacerbating effect or make postpartum complications like blood clots or bleeding worse? It's probably you, Dr. Collier, I think. No, I haven't seen any data 
that would make me suspect that that would be worse in the postpartum period. Um, you know, there these um, clinical trials go pretty extensive safety monitoring, and that wasn't necessarily a, a finding that they noted in the non-pregnant population. And so I don't necessarily think that would be expected to be a complication in pregnant or postpartum patients. Um, the next question is, uh, and I think you might have already answered this, Dr. Callier, but it's um, a specific question about the timing of if you get the vaccine and you're lactating, how, when do potential auto, when do potential antibodies appear in the breast milk? Like how long does it take? Do we know that? I don't know off the top of my head know how quickly that develops, but you know, I think most people generating antibody responses, it takes a couple of weeks. And so I think the same would be expected for the, you know, mammary production of antibodies as well. Yeah, I guess it might also be fair to say that generally things that are in the maternal circulation tend to appear in breast milk uh, within days or hours, but not weeks, right? So from the time that there might be a response in the patient until it lands in the breast milk might be a shorter period of time potentially. Sure, yeah. And, and the trials when they were set up were really expecting that the immune response in non-pregnant people would take about 14 days. That's kind of, they, they thought there might be sort of similar risks of COVID in the first 14 days and then really start. So that's the kind of thinking of how long regular sort of non-pregnant non -pregnant, non -pregnant people would, would take to make the response. Great. Um, and then the next question is, are you recommending a specific trimester to get the vaccine? Um, I think I can summarize by saying no, um, we're not recommending a specific trimester. Um, we're recommending that you uh, make the decision to receive the vaccine based on other um, life situations and risk factors that you might have and whether you're included in a group that's being offered the vaccine at that time. Um, Next question is how, I think this is different from what we've talked about so far specifically. So how long do they expect immunity from the vaccine to last for an individual? Um, Dr. Zash, maybe you can dive in there. Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's honestly something we don't know yet. Um, as you know, they sort of um, publish these results within just a few months of the follow-up period. So we know that at least for two or three months, um, this, this vaccine will last. But part of the next stage for all of these vaccines is figuring out how long does it last? When does it need to get, you know, when do we need to get it again? Um, what we know from sort of natural COVID infection is that probably for most everybody, there's at least three months of protection. Um, for a lot of people, there's probably at least six months, but we're so early on, we, we don't know enough about that. Um, but that's a huge part of what's coming next. And we should know uh, in the next while. Yeah, I would, I would say that that's, that's another argument for why ongoing research and accumulation of information as patients are getting vaccinated is important so that we can find out whether there are certain specific timings or, or changes in efficacy based on when you administer the vaccine during pregnancy or even in um, certain populations of non-pregnant individuals as well. Dr. Collier, does the mRNA cross the placenta? So for this specific vaccine, I don't think we have any of that information. Um, like I said, based on the stability of the mRNA molecule, we wouldn't anticipate even if small amounts got out of your muscle into your circulation and through the placenta that it would last for very long, but there, you know, certainly there is a theoretical potential um, that has been unstudied. And I think even looking forward, that will be a very difficult thing to study. You can imagine in order to set up that or answer that exact question, you need to give a vaccine to someone and then get their placenta within the next couple of days. And I don't think a lot of patients, unless they're already delivering um, during that time uh, would would want to contribute um, a piece of placenta to ask that question or a piece, uh, you know, sampling from the fetal blood system to identify that. But we think that, you know, theoretically that risk is quite low. And so when taking in the risks of getting of a severe COVID-19 infection versus the 
very small potential theoretical risk of the mRNA crossing the placenta and, and then the pot low potential for causing harm. Um, that's why it's been approved for use if you are or pregnant or offered for you if you are pregnant. Um, I, I just thought it just occurred to me, it might be helpful maybe to just point out that mRNA is a naturally occurring substance in everyone's body, um, including fetuses. So, um, you know, the, the fact that this is an mRNA vaccine and the fact that we haven't really seen commercially available mRNA vaccines before, I think is, you know, a little bit um, causes people to think and kind of stop short. Um, but I think it's also maybe helpful to understand that mRNA is, is how we function as human beings uh, on a moment to moment basis. Um, it's just a naturally occurring substance that we all have. Um, the next question, is there a spot on the vaccination form to indicate that you're pregnant? Um, so uh, no, uh, I don't think there is. I have to say I have not received my vaccine yet, so I have not filled out my form, um, but, but I don't believe that there is anything uh, on the form that asks you that question. But there is, um, you know, for people who are interested in, in sort of one and be able to have what happens to them sort of be part of science. Uh, the CDC has an app um, where they are asking um, people who've been vaccinated to sign up, tell them about their symptoms afterwards. And this includes some information on um, pregnancy. So for people who are interested, I think that could be really helpful. Great, yeah, that's- Yeah, we had discussed this at the, the SMFM, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine webinar too. And it was unclear to us whether they had included that it's a app by the CDC called vSafe. And I think it's unclear whether they have the question on lactation or pregnancy on that. But I think, um, you know, they have stated they plan to follow, you know, pregnant patients getting vaccinated even through the CDC network. The next question is, um, after receiving the vaccine, is there any extra monitoring needed for adverse reactions, et cetera, for someone who is pregnant? Dr. Collier? No, we don't have any specific recommendations different I, I, from the usual. I think um, maybe D Dr. Zash can speak more to these specific recommendations about monitoring for very short periods of time right after receiving the vaccine for any uh, severe allergic reactions, which again are rare, but you wanna watch for those in non-pregnant and pregnant individuals. Yeah, I mean, I think as we're rolling out here at BI, um, they're having people who are vaccinated watched for uh, 30 minutes afterwards to make sure that there's no immediate allergic reaction, which again could be treated, uh, like we treat all allergic reactions and can really happen with any new medication, new vaccination, and it has been uh, extraordinarily rarely reported, but we're just being super careful. Um, I don't think anything extra about pregnancy would make that shorter or longer. Um, and, and really the thing is just to take Tylenol if there's a fever. I think that's really the only, only thing. And we would suggest that for, for everyone, but especially in pregnant people. And then this is a related question for pregnant patients with an existing allergy and history of anaphylaxis. Is it recommended to wait until after delivery to get vaccinated? Um, and the answer to that I believe is no, um, but if you have an allergy or anaphylaxis to one of the components of the vaccine, then that's sort of a different consideration. Is that right, Dr. Zash? That's right. Um, you know, a lot of people sort of are very familiar with if you have an egg allergy, you shouldn't get the flu shot. And that's really very specific to the flu vaccine. It's made using sort of egg-based product so it has some egg in it. There's nothing like that specifically for this vaccine, um, but if you have a history, um, basically we're recommending if you have a history of anaphylaxis, meaning you know a, a, a very severe allergic reaction where your lips have swelled, you had to be intubated, couldn't breathe, that kind of reaction, you should always discuss that um, before vaccination to make sure that, that none of those products are in this vaccine. This vaccine has very few things in it. So um, we're not worried. We're not worried about peanuts. We're not worried about eggs, nothing very common. Um, but for people who, who know they have anaphylaxis, they should talk um, to the provider before getting the vaccine. 
I guess polyethylene glycol, oddly, is uh, is the thing that uh, I've seen stand out as if you happen to have a history of anaphylaxis to that, um, that's one of the um, components of the vaccine. Um, let's see. Uh, is there any likelihood that pregnant people could end up qualifying for access to vaccinations earlier than the general low risk population because we are at higher risk for COVID? I, I haven't seen that in the Massachusetts plan so far. Um, and I don't know if that would change over time, but I, I haven't seen that so far. I haven't necessarily seen that either, although, you know, if pregnant patients are included in any of the first like phase 1A groups they're saying that should still be offered. Next question, I think Dr. Zash, you may have already answered with the sort of uh, registry, but if I get the vaccine as planned within the coming weeks, is there a registry I should sign up for so that someone can track me for future data for pregnant women? Yeah, I mean, I think the CDC app is, is one thing I've heard of. Um, I also understand that University of Washington is, is trying to start a registry. Um, I don't have the details right here about that, but I'm sure it'd be on their website. And, and so those are the two that I know about. Yeah, I have seen that um, link circulating out from the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, it's basically an online registry and it's voluntary. So you have to um, go online and, and register and kind of sign the online consent form for that. Um, but certainly the CDC has plans to continue to follow data even out to two to three years post-vaccination to check for adverse outcomes in the pregnancy or um, also check to make sure of safety in the neonates too. There is a recommendation in Europe um, to wait three months following conception to receive the vaccine. What data is this based on? Is there any discussion surrounding this recommendation in the United States? I think it's not based on any data, if that is a recommendation. Um, so I see Dr. Zash and Dr. Collier are, I think, agreeing with that. So I, I, I don't think there is any data around that. Um, and so I wouldn't want to speculate on why um, that recommendation was made in Europe. Um, and uh, there was a lot of discussion to answer the question about uh, the US recommendations. There was a tremendous amount of discussion um, at a national level, um, as well as locally here in Massachusetts um, around what the recommendations were going to be around pregnancy. Um, and it was really a decision uh, based on the available data as well as our historical experience with other vaccines. Um, and what we know about pregnancy and the risks of COVID disease. Um, so question about enrolling in a trial. So um, maybe this is a, a good opportunity to talk about um, if people are sort of, this is different from, I think, uh, enrolling in a database if you've received the vaccine, but rather what the opportunities are might be to prospectively enroll in a trial. Um, I don't know, Dr. Zash, maybe you might be able to shed some light on what opportunities there might be. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know of any plans uh, to, you know, I don't know when these trials might start. I don't know where they might be. You know, at Beth Israel, we did not, uh, we were not part of the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine. We've been parts of other vaccines, um, which will probably wait till they get more data to invite uh, uh, pregnant people in. Um, but on the on the drug site, if you, basically if you Google things, um, and that usually people running studies are very excited, uh, you can kind of find out where the sites might be. I, I don't know if Dr. Collier knows any more about the vaccine sites. No, not necessarily. I think right now. The, at least the first phase three trials, most are exclude, excluding pregnancy for the first efficacy data. But um, you know, hopefully in the near future, pregnancy and lactation will definitely be included, uh, or not a strict exclusion criteria at least. Um, I know, you know, in the greater Boston area, myself and others are trying to at least uh, prospectively enroll participants to who are pregnant and lactating to get that information. But that's not part of a clinical trial it's more be observations made to make sure that you know at least 
biologically that pregnancy and lactation um, is eliciting the similar vaccine response as the non-pregnant patients. Great. I think in our last five minutes, I might just go through a little bit lightning style, uh, lightning round to answer some of the questions that we haven't really touched on before. Um, so a question here about um, what M mRNA might do um, if it were to reach the fetus. And I think uh, we don't necessarily know that, but it should direct the cell to make uh, a protein. Am I right about that? We would think. For a short period of time. Yes. For a short period of time, yes. Um, and a protein potentially being an antibody. Um, is the series of two vaccines anticipated to provide long-term protection or is it expected to require a booster each year like the flu shot? I think we don't know that. Um, okay. Um, is it okay to feed and pump right after getting the vaccine or should we pump and dump? Um, it is not recommended to pump and dump. Am I right about that? Okay, um, so you should proceed as normal and feed your baby. Is it possible that another company's vaccine can be more beneficial than another, especially Moderna's that is looking more closely at pregnant women? Um, right now, uh, this is actually fairly clear. We are not recommending one vaccine over another. Uh, and I see my experts are shaking their heads yes, that they agree. Um, so whatever vaccine becomes available to you, depending on what your group you're in and the timing of the um, distribution of the vaccine is the vaccine that you should consider taking. Um, and none of them are part of that class of vaccines that we say are act, live attenuated that would not be recommended. So all the vaccine candidates are allowed in pregnancy right now. Perfect, thank you for, um, for clarifying that. Yeah, that's super important. Um, I have a family member who has just completed her 10 day isolation after contracting COVID. I know that 10 days after isolation is the latest CDC recommendation. Uh, very nervous about seeing her again, whereas I'm 35 weeks. Is it overcautious of me to avoid her for a couple extra weeks? Um, so generally speaking, we are uh, really recommending that after about 35 to 36 weeks, regardless of who your contacts outside of your household might be, that you uh, only limit yourself to contact with people with whom you live, um, regardless of, of whether they might have been ill or not, um, really limited to only your household. Um, are there any arguments to be made for a pregnant patient working in a hospital, not with COVID, to not be vaccinated? Um, I think we've we've uh, sort of uh, come to kind of the statement here as well as uh, nationally and locally that uh, pregnant people should be offered the vaccine in the same way as others within their risk group. Um, Question about fertility planning, and I think I can answer that your fertility planning or infertility treatment should not be altered by the vaccine schedule or vice versa. Your vaccine schedule should not be altered by your plans for pregnancy. Um, have COVID symptoms and complications in infected expected mothers been found to affect the fetus? That's a very complex question, I think. Um, and certainly there have been adverse outcomes, pregnancy outcomes in patients um, who have been ill with COVID. Whether those are direct effects of the virus itself um, or interventions that we as a medical team needed to, needed to, uh, to perform, such as an early delivery, for example, um, because a patient was sick um, is important to kind of consider. Um, I think for the most part, uh, our, our experience has been that COVID affects pregnant people, certainly, and may affect pregnant people more severely than non-pregnant people. We have not seen a lot of um, observations that uh, it affects newborns um, in quite a severe way. Is that fair to say, Dr. Collier? Okay. Yes, that's a great short answer <laughs> to a long <laughs> question. It's a complicated question. We could spend a whole hour on that one, I think. Um, uh, no trimester is better than another for the vaccine, um, and, and no, uh, changes should be made to your planning for pregnancy. Um, and then let me just see if there's anything here that we haven't touched on. 
Uh, do we have any concerns um, at all about this vaccine in the lactating pregnant or postpartum populations? This is probably a good note to end on, I, I think, to sort of summarize. And I think um, I'll start, but I'll, I'll leave it to our experts to, to finish up the conversation today. So um, I think physicians always have a really hard time answering a question um, that asks us to say that we have no concerns at all. Um, I think, you know, we always have concerns about one thing or another, um, and we do try to think about concerns as relative in terms of risks versus benefits. And I think that in this particular situation, we feel confident um, that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks um, and the risks of COVID um, outweigh the risk of the vaccine. Um, and there just doesn't seem to be any evidence that the vaccine itself is dangerous during pregnancy. Um, maybe we'll go to uh, Dr. Zash first and then Dr. Collier, you can wrap it up for us. I mean, I really don't know that I have much else to add. I completely agree. I think that the benefits are going to outweigh any um, potential theoretical risks. And really, you know, that's only even there because we don't have the data uh, yet, um, but it's coming. So I, I think that, um, you know, avoiding COVID during pregnancy and lactation is a huge benefit. And I think the other thing to remember is, you know, these vaccines have been shown to be incredibly effective, at least in a short time, even more effective than lots of other vaccines. So the potential benefit is, is even greater with these uh, particular mRNA vaccines. Yeah, I would say it's, it's hard to live with this sort of uncertainty because we haven't had all the information in this population, but, Again, any theoretical or potential risks are low compared to the higher risk in pregnancy of contracting a severe COVID-19 infection. Um, and then there's also, again, I would say that potential benefit of being helpful to the mother, but also to the um, newborn of transferring um, protection to the newborn who won't be able to get a vaccine for quite some time. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Zash and Dr. Collier. This has really been uh, a really fantastic hour. Um, we we're here um, every week um, to answer your questions and uh, we'll do everything that we can to respond to changing times and changing concerns. Um, but we really appreciate your taking the time to spend with us um, today as patients together with us here at BIDMC. Um, and please feel free to join us again if you found that that's helpful. Um, but again, Dr. Zash, Dr. Collier, really, really um, grateful to you for spending the time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, stay well, everyone, uh, and stay safe and uh, have a happy uh, week. <laughs>